What's up, guys? Welcome to an all-new episode of Convos on the Pedicab. This is actually the first episode of the new year, and I'm joined by a very special guest, UT basketball legend, um, former McDonald's All-American, Chris Clack. Before we get started, we got to give a big shout out to our sponsor, 10th Planet Austin, 10PATX on Instagram and Twitter. Get woke and improve your jujitsu at the same time. There's a lot of civil unrest going around. You know, our police got defunded. Um, there's really no better time than now to learn how to intelligently defend yourself. We got a phenomenal jujitsu program taught by number fifth ranked grappler in the world, Kyle Bain. We got a great MMA program taught by former UFC fighter Andrew Craig and jujitsu black belt and pro fighter Cody Hofstadter. We got also a great Muay Thai program taught by uh, pro fighter Sean Tal Perry, and we have strength and conditioning taught by the world famous Isik the Viking Ninja. Our gym is located between 35 and 71 in Southeast Austin, so if you're in the area and you want to learn how to intelligently defend yourself and learn a multitude of martial arts that will be um, extremely beneficial both on the mats and in the streets, come through 10th Planet Austin, 10 PATX on Twitter and Instagram. Anyway, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the, pe on the pedicab. Uh, thank you for having me. Dude, I'm excited, man. You, uh, I feel really honored, dude. You're you're a legend in the city of Austin. That's what they say. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't really consider myself that, but if that's what it is, it's what it is. So, uh, I'm I'm really I'm born and raised here. I love Austin, and, uh, and I and I enjoy being here, and, and I enjoy the people here. So yeah, well, I mean, you're Austin through and through. Yeah. Um, a lot of you guys aren't aware. Like Chris actually went to Anderson High School, and it's in the Austin school district. And you were the first and possibly only McDonald's All American at your high school. Uh, yes. Um, I was so it was an honor. It was, it was I mean, it was it was a surprise at the same time, but it was fun, you know. And I mean? you were a four-year starter at UT, yes. which is pretty remarkable. And and UT was a pretty solid team back then. Uh, yeah, we went to the elite uh, Sweet Sixteen. That's the furthest we went before the you know, the TJs with the Elite Eight. But uh, Sweet Sixteen was the furthest we went, and I missed the tournament maybe once out of out of four, four years, years, right? Yeah, so, so what was it like being a McDonald's All American? in high school in Austin. What was that whole experience like? Like I said before, like, you know, basketball then, you know, you know, Texas is a football state, so, you know, you got your kids from, you know, Indiana and Chicago. Um, that's where, you know, Kevin Garnett and Vince Carter which was in that class. So, um, and Stephon Marbury, you got New York. So, Texas is, was not really known for basketball, um, but for me to get that honor and go out there, I wanted to represent as best as I could, and I, and I think I did a pretty good job. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you were in the slam dunk contest too, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> second, were... second place to the greatest dunker. I, I just was on the horn today, and, and they asked me who was the best dunker I've ever seen. And Vince Carter. And it's Vince Carter. Vince Carter, when yeah. he dunked, dunked over that seven-foot uh, French uh, dude, that yeah. was <laughs> – Yeah, that was, pretty, that was pretty nice. If he played like that as a whole career, he may have won a title or two. Uh, he was just on bad teams, I think. Um he got to play. No, with Toronto, time. he was good. He he like Toronto was pretty solid when he was on. I Toronto. mean, back, but like like back then, there was only one superstar on the team. It wasn't five or six like. And others. in New Jersey, he was um he was on New Jersey in like but, the early two thousand. Name one other superstar. Jason Kidd. He had, uh, he had yeah. Jason Kidd. He had Keith Van Horn. They, they had Kerry Kittles like that. That was a pretty solid. But I'm saying I didn't. But I'm thinking back. I mean, you still you got the you got the Chicago Bulls out there. You got these other teams. The Lakers are still good. So. Compared to those teams, I mean, they had to really play well. To yeah, those yeah. I, mean, it's, it's, I, I understand that perspective. It was Michael Jordan was still playing at the time. So you still keep in touch with any of these guys? Uh, or did you make? Yeah, I don't do social media. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll talk to somebody on an Instagram message or a, 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 a Instagram or social media message. But other than that, not not physically. So you're not really like you're not still in touch with like your UT teammates or any of that? Or like oh, my teammates. Yeah, I talked to you know several of my teammates um, that live here, even live other places. But because um, a few of them went pro, like like. You definitely you were a pretty solid team. Like you had what Chris Mim? Yes, Chris Mim went pro. Um, I played with Gabe Maneki. Uh, but he didn't uh, go to Reggie Freeman. Reggie uh, Freeman went to the. Did, he, did Reggie he, Freeman go to the league or no, did he, he go he to Europe? To, oh, he went to Europe. He went and to did Europe. very well. Actually, he has retired uh, jersey in, in Slovenia oh, and Serbia. So yeah, he did very well overseas. But no, as far as NBA, just Mim that I played with at Texas. Um, and then I ended up getting drafted and playing summer league, but never actually. You never, you never made it. No, because I, I you, never. You, well, you were the camp, so. you were the wrong position. You were just the wrong height. Yeah, that's uh, what it was. You were you were just literally. If you were two inches taller, you probably could have been a starter. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, if you. <laughs> and then I, then when you talk about NBA, it's right place, right time situation. Like I had a pretty 
crappy agent when I first got drafted, so I had to switch agents. So there's a whole lot of politics to go. A lot of, with, a lot of yeah. That, I understand. I mean, because I mean, for someone who had the career that you had in the Big Twelve, you should have been a first round draft pick, right? Yeah, I was MVP as Phoenix as well when I was getting you know before the draft. So I got MVP in the pro in the, in the combine, and um, no, did well. But like I said, I had a probably maybe agent. maybe if you went pro after your junior year, you could have. Yeah, but people wasn't going early back then. Like people, people still went pro after their junior year. Yeah, uh, like when I was in school, like Kevin Garnett was like the Same first trend. to yeah, go yeah, straight yeah. to the NBA. Like people were still, you know, they wasn't leaving school early, and if you did, it was like a, a big ooh, a big risk. So yeah. um, now that I think about, it, if I look like today, yes, I'd have left my sophomore year. <laughs> yeah. So I would have stayed one. Two I think years. yeah. I well, being a McDonald's All American, if you just you could have been one and done, yeah, and you would have yeah. got you would have been if, if you were a McDonald's All American today. Uh, I'm one and, and done. You would have been one and done, and you'd be making <laughs> tens of millions of dollars. <laughs> but, but the thing about me, though, is like I don't want to just be one and done and go there and then sit the bench the whole time. You know what I mean? I want to actually. You want to play? Play. You know. But at the same at the same time, though, like, um, you are kind of getting a little bit used by the school that's you're playing for. That's that's understood. Um, and. You kind of use them in this backside. You know, they're giving you the chance to get exposed on TV to even get drafted. So and you get a free education. And you get a free education. And you get to go to all the bars. And you get, and to, you, you get to cut in line. You get to bang every girl you want. I don't you know if you, do. if you took advantage <laughs> of that. But. Uh, I don't even hardly remember what I did in college. To be honest with you, it was a lot of what probably what you mentioned. So. Um, at the same time, you know, I feel like that was probably your life all through high school too. Being a McDonald's, no, 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 no. High no? school, I was very. That's the thing about me. Like, I, I, when I got to college, I went bananas. You went bananas. I was a homebody. I didn't go anywhere. Oh, you did was just work out and play ball because you, you, you had parents that were pretty on top of you, right? Yeah, yeah. So I they didn't ball, let you. Yeah, went yeah. to church every Sunday um, and those things. But after after I left the college, it was like you know, because I wanted to get it. I told my mom back when I wanted to get my ears pierced. I have three older sisters, you know, so that had nothing to do with it. Just uh, she's like, if, you, if I want another girl, I'd have, I had another. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that was a style back there getting your ears yeah. pierced. So I was, she's like, "Well, you, you, as long as you live under my roof, you're not gonna get your ears pierced." So I said, "Okay." As soon as I get to college, I get my ears pierced. I get a tattoo, um, <laughs> but you know she was fine with it because you know at, at that point you know you're an adult, you're making your own decisions. So I'm not under your roof anymore. So I'm living in the dorm now. So yeah, yeah, um, it was all good. But you know, well, what was the experience like playing at UT? Uh, and, and being like, because you were a star, being a four year start at the University of Texas, like what was what was day to day life like? Like what was that? My whole? main focus, like you know, you get up, you know, you got class, of course, um, which I'm sure you went to every class uh, yeah. for the most part. <laughs> yeah, because sure. um, no, because they had no, because we had so many guys on our team that wasn't going to classes that they end up hiring a person to live on our floor to make sure we went to class. Did you ever watch Blue Mountain State? Oh, no, I didn't. It's, it's a, like it's, it was a show on FX about like a fake college football team that just made a whole mo- like a mockery of it, and like there was one episode where all these guys had their own nerds that just did all their work for them. <laughs> like, no, uh, it's not quite that. You know, I had a bunch of tutors and, and a bunch of help. You know, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, you know, I did my own work. Um, but it, it was just study hall practice. Uh, study hall again, more practice, and trying to get home to eat in time to wake up again and do it again the next day. So when I graduated uh, college, or you left college my senior year, I was so relieved to ha- be able to ha- have my own time and not be on somebody else's time the whole time. Like, they had my every move. They knew where I was 24-7, yeah. unless I was on 6th Street or something that night. <laughs> and, then, and then who knows? Who knew where Clack was at? <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. But no, look, I mean, I'm sure, like, there were a lot of benefits and perks. Like, oh, you know, yeah. you hear a lot of stories of people just getting these, like, really these no-show jobs, like, you know, because college athletes, they don't get paid, right? But they generate so much money for the university mm-hmm. that I'm sure, like, some booster would, you know, could say, hey, man, uh, I got this really good job for you. It's going to pay, like, some insane amount of money. All you got to do is just hang out for a few hours, and they just will get around the rules by giving people, like, these no-show jobs. Yeah, um, you know, that stuff ca- that, that happens, happens. That happens. You know, I've, I've had the perks. I've had jobs and – you know, I got you know people. You know, when you play it and you're on, you're on TV, so they know your face. So you you'll get some deals here and now. But for the most part, everything was done pretty legit. You just you just working hard and it's, just, it's, just, it's, it's my it's focus grind. was it's getting to the NBA and uh, you know you get your scholarship checks. Make sure I save that money to 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 get to the next month. You know what I mean? Yeah. As as, as you know, mm-hmm. cause, you know I went home every once in a while since I'm ten minutes from the house. But at the same time, I didn't want to go home, so I was like. And if I needed to go home and get something, I would. You would, yeah. And I understand. Like, nah, I and then, so you went to Europe, right? Yeah, I went to Italy for five years, six years. I went three years, and I took a break to go back to school. And then went a year, a semester of school, and then went back to play overseas the next two and a half years. 
um, that I once I left there, I played in the D League for. For the Austin Torres, you just yeah. never left. You just, <laughs> yeah. you just keep going. Came back. Uh, Dennis Johnson was the coach at the time, rest in peace. And, uh, he actually uh, passed during the season I was playing. Oh, and, shit. And uh, we, I happened to have to go to California to be a Paul Bear in his funeral, which was an honor and great. That, that, so I got a chance yeah. to meet Larry Bird and you know, Bill Russell. All the greats were there at his funeral. So it's like it was, it was pretty ridiculous, pretty surreal, actually, because I, I never thought I'd physically see all these guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's also pretty cool that after the career you've had, you're still in Austin. Yeah, um, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, Austin's you're Austin my through city. Through, dude. This, yeah, is, this my, is your spot. This is yeah. my city. It's like you know everything you know is here. It's my resources are here, so I'm um, Austin has, has grown, has gotten, has become known. I mean, the day I saw Austin in the commercials, that I felt like hey, we. We're, we're, we're big enough. We've made it because you know they always say San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, but rarely do they bring up Austin. Oh. But now they do. So. Now Austin's like superseded all these cities. Yeah. Like it is the spot to go to. Yeah. Um. So what was the, what was the difference between playing overseas in Europe versus playing at UT? Um. Just we only play once once a week. You know, not not as much practice. We practice you know in the morning and in the afternoon, and then played on Sunday so it's just a lot more downtown what about the lifestyle like from a lifestyle standpoint uh same thing you know living in Europe you know I had to learn the language had to you know being from Texas you know I understand Spanish but you know which is similar to Italian something but not everything but yeah. um some of the words are similar but uh just trying to catch on to the language and uh, fortunately my coach spoke English and Italian which which is rare because a lot of those coaches just speak Italian, Italian yeah. speak. or you're having a, 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 a player over there, the older guy that speaks English and kind of translate for everybody. Um, but at the same time, my coach had a, you know, everything he said in Italian, he said in English. So I was able to learn a lot of language that didn't go to eat at the restaurant. You got to order your food and all that. So And they, it's a little different in Europe. I mean, I know you got paid a decent amount being an American. I feel like they probably pay the Americans a little bit more. Yes. Um, it all depends on, you know, what team, if you're a Euro league team or if it's. And you were in a top, you were in a top league. Yeah, right? I was, I was like in the second, second, second division league and the, there was Serie A and then second division. I was Serie in the second B? division. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were in the championship two years in a row to go to Serie A, but we lost the championship. I tore my hamstring oh, and, and we okay. lost. Yeah. So um, yeah, I played on two teams to kind of go up to the first division. And then my, my third year, I actually played in the first division in Naples, and I was only there for six months, and I left because they wasn't paying me. Um, so, what, what were you getting paid out there? Uh, you make six figures. Like, you make six figures. Yeah, right? My first contract was one hundred twenty. Hundred twenty thousand, and that's and that's um, also in Europe. They don't they give you a house and a car, well, right? Yeah, they give you a car to, uh, uh, within you know a good size. Most of those guys that own those teams are there probably own a dealership as well, or have a, a connection with a dealership. So they give you a car, uh, they give you a place to stay, which is like I say, it's you know, all in the contract. Everything's in the contract. Uh, you get I get two first class tickets to go home when we ever get a break, and then three to fly people there so they give you five tickets plane tickets so um it, it was fun it was it was a, it was different i taught a different, learned a different language and learned a different culture were you a household name out there when you were playing uh, or was it kind of just in like... the city that i was in yes because i was in the paper all the time i mean it's very different it's, it's very it's just like the nba but in europe in europe you know yeah I mean? that makes sense you know and 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 on, t and on the same time like if you were in the first division like you know you have your league so now you know it's it's more global the NBA and and being able to see those games over there because back back when we didn't have so much social media and access to to view those games so it was harder you know guys got out of college got to make a decision do I want to go overseas and 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 maybe you know get seen or do I want to stay here and play in the D League which they don't really have they don't G League now they don't have but uh, but you no know, not make very much money I, I mean what would you do. If you're, if you're in I that know, I'm going, I'm going, you're going overseas to get yeah, paid, yeah. Yeah, you're going overseas to get paid. 100,000, Nowadays, they still get to watch your games overseas. You know? Yeah, and, and and a lot of these Euro stars still make a million now. Like, yeah. you can still make close to a million now in Europe. Um, how are your uh, how are your finances? Like, did you, did you like, manage your money well? Like, no, or um, that? That, and, and I did not. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that you know, question you said earlier about, you know, financial programs to teach kids how to – do certain things because you know I didn't come from a wealthy family. You know, my parents were well off. You know they were middle class. They took care. I never needed anything. But at the same time, you know I never knew how to write a checkbook or balance a checkbook or you know they didn't teach me these things. So I, I didn't learn them in school either. So no, of course, yeah. <laughs> so um, those are the things. You know, so you know my parents need anything. My family thing. You know they got it. You know I was I was. I had the money to give it to him, and I and I just spent, 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 didn't save, didn't invest. I didn't know anything about those things. Yeah, you know. So you know, now that I know, you know, it's it's easy for me to to, to look in hindsight. And, yeah, and, yes. you know, maybe talk to some young kids about 
what they should do so that does, that doesn't happen. Yes. You know, um, there's some statistic, right, where like 78% of NBA players go broke within three to five years of Because a lot of times they, they're not taught how to invest their money. They're not, you're not taught. And then, and then once you start playing, who knows, you, you may blow your knee out or, you know, you something may happen where and, yeah. you get traded or you, whatever yeah. and then your money's different. Yeah, and a lot of these people, like, they grew up in, like, the hood and stuff like that. Yeah. And they're, um, they're funding everybody's lifestyle because, you know, when you make it in that type of area, like everybody makes it. So you want to help all the people that helped you. Cause I mean, if you're that talented or that, I mean, look, I grew up in like a suburban area, but I still grew up in New York. So I Mm -hmm. kind of understand some of these things. And if you're really good at a sport and you're in a bad area, people will look out for you and protect you because you're like their golden ticket out. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you're like really good at basketball, really good at football, like gangs don't mess with you. You know, people leave you alone. Mm -hmm. Like you get invited to things like people are, people look out for you. Yeah. And so eventually it's like, once you make it, it's like, well, now you got to look out for them. Yes. And, Does that make sense? Like, yes, because like I said, and now that I'm older, I, you know, you, there's things like, like non-profit organizations or, or things that where you can, you know, do things and make money to where you know they can get involved and, and you can kind of, you know, be able to feed everybody without having to use all your resources. All your, your resources to do, to do that. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. And there's ways around it to get help and to get certain funding to, 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 to take care of yeah, those Yeah, because generally speaking, once you, like, if you grew up in poverty, right, or even if you grow up like working class or middle class and you just get make it big right off the bat as a young kid, you, it's like human nature to want to help you. It, yeah. It's human nature to want to like help your family and help your friends and do stuff like that. You know, yeah. and I think a lot of people, they go broke because they're, they overextend themselves to a lot of people that don't necessarily have their best interests at heart. Yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's what I think happens. But um, I also want to, I brought this up too because of the BLM protests. Um, what did you, so what, what do you think about all that stuff when when, when it went down? Uh, I I'm all for people who want to go out and and you know peacefully uh, express their feelings yeah. about things. Um, so I mean I have no no issue, but when when it starts getting wild and violence comes into play, that's where I mean I draw the line because you know things could get done without violence or somebody getting maced or papers or shot in the face with anything. Yeah, or so. like small businesses getting lit on fire and all that stuff. Right? Yeah, like, so. Yeah, no, I, I am I fully um, agree with you considering I make a living, you know, um, based on the generosity and the prosperity of small businesses give, being a pedicab driver in Austin. So I'm fully on, on board with that. There's also the fact that, like, a lot of people are pissed off, man. Like, you know, when a group of people feels like they've been treated like shit in their own country for, like, 400 years – Eventually, like people yeah. snap, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's it, I mean, like a few guys, just like the whole George Floyd situation. Like, it's, it's enough is enough someday. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. We, you, we can only say so much or hold our tongue so often. So um, it's just gotten to the point where you know it, it's something has to be done, something has to be said. You, you can only talk, 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 mm-hmm. talk all you so, want to. So and you have to actually do something. Exactly. Or actually, make the effort yes. to make a change. Make a change, and, and that that brings you to the next point, and it's that. Um, these pro like, in order for these protests to actually do anything productive, there needs to be actionable solutions um, put forward to make it so that people don't want to do this stuff. And I think that um, a big reason why, um, and maybe I'm wrong, right? But I think a big reason why um, black people get treated a little bit diff- well, differently by police officers, and also feels that they're being treated differently by police officers, is because it's, there's a huge wealth gap. And you know, generally speaking. Um, when people like live in poverty, you know, there's more crime takes place when mm-hmm. you're in poverty. Um, and then because of that, police officers are more willing to profile people who live in certain areas or are in certain areas because of that. Yes. Um, so if you were to like start figuring out ways to help, you know, build generational wealth amongst black communities, a lot of this police violence, y- you're going to see it a lot less. Mm-hmm. That, that's, I mean, that, that's what I think because I think a lot of this is tied into like, a lot of a lot of this is tied into poverty, and that's why you know, you know, we're working towards, you know, these STEM programs to teach kids how to um, financially, you know, invest money or write, even write a checkbook or uh, some of the things or, or use a computer, use a, a spreadsheet, Excel, whatever it is, um, so that you know they can if they want to own a business they can, they can do they, that. Yeah, if they want to if this this they got to research they got to go out there and, and, and read well, or, what kind of program is this can you tell me more about that uh it's just a stem program that you know um well actually doing a foundation um it's called badges versus uh 
uh, buckets versus badges. So I'm, I was on the radio today speaking about it. We're doing a ride along with the police, um, and you have games with the kids between the kids, and the, and the kids are going to have a question and answer um, segment, and they're going to be able to ask the cops anything, difficult questions they may want to know, um, and then. The cops have to answer these difficult questions, you know, and, and then on the ride along, I'll have some questions and answers for them as well. Because, um, you know, being an African American, I've been profiled before, and, and I had to the point where I had to call my cop friends, like, you know, this happened, why did they pull me over? He's like, well, it's been known that area for, you know, this amount, this kind of person to be in this area driving this kind of car. So um, just, just so they'll know these things. So uh, the bridge that gap between the kids and the community and the cops. Um, so, so they all get on the same page because not all cops are bad. Not all cops are out there to, to get you in trouble. They're yeah. actually scared of their, for them, themselves. They they want to. Because I've been handcuffed before just on a regular stop just because guys like, why well, I'm not going to run. I'm, I was in school at the time. And uh cop was like, well, you're a big guy. I got to put the handcuffs on. I was, okay. So, uh, but it's not, not necessary. For somebody like myself, I wasn't going to do anything. But they don't know me from the next person, so um, just things like that. No, I understand. You know? And then even um, so, I met you while we were like subbing at ALC, and a whole bunch of these kids at ALC just got caught smoking weed. Yeah, like <laughs> you know what I mean. Like a whole bunch of these kids were there just because they got caught smoking weed in school. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there were some that committed like serious crimes, and like some of these kids, they all wanted to be drug. They all wanted to be like you know Tony Montana from Scarface. And there was just, <laughs> A lot of bullshit that went down, but like overall, these weren't like bad, dangerous, no, like scary no. kids. These were just kids who like to smoke weed, and uh, they happen to get caught. But at the same time, it's like kids at Austin High and Anderson High probably smoke just as much weed and party just as much, if not more, than the kids at ALC. But they're not there. Yeah, they they probably and I'm just speculating have you know have a bad home life or don't have the right person tell them yes or no at home. Um, but they that could be you know here nor there, but. Um, like you said, you know, they can just also just be kids, just trying to be. And I think they're badasses and want to, you know, yeah. get that talk to my town. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, um, I also want to talk about the financial literacy stuff because I mentioned earlier, you know, seventy-eight percent of NBA players, um, no, actually NFL players, sixty percent of NBA players go broke. Mm -hmm. It's seventy-eight percent of NFL players that go broke in three to five years. It's even worse for the NFL. Um, but. That being said, you know, there's also like billions of dollars generated annually just amongst from salaries alone. If you look, if you factor in like every player in the league in terms of what they make on an annual basis, that's probably over a billion dollars easy. Mm -hmm. Imagine like if every single NBA player had to spend an entire like 200 hours with a financial agent during their rookie year. Well, they should. I yeah. mean, <laughs> when you when you get drafted, they we have a seminar i guess they make all the rookies or draftees go in where well, they tell you about you know saving your money and you know not spending it all on your family or just taking care of your family they they even talk about you know uh, uh, groupies and all that so they you go through a seminar where they teach you as before you get drafted what to look for you know or what might happen yeah, to you but that's when one you get all this money half, half of these guys are probably sleeping through it and it's not really <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right, uh, and they and even if they do, it goes in one ear and out the other. They're like, oh, that won't happen to me, type of deal. But. No, you need to. Um, what I think they need to do, because um, I think that a lot of the problems that um, a lot of the problems that like people are going through right now could potentially be fixed by this within a generation, but just because of all the billions of dollars that get generated through salaries. Mm -hmm. If that money started getting reinvested into black communities, you wouldn't see the shit that we saw this summer. After yeah. within like 20 years, you wouldn't see any of that shit. Or you would see a very small amount of it, um, and I think that you, every NBA player should have to um, have to spend two hundred hours with a financial I mean, analyst if, if, that, that's babysitting you and making sure that you're doing X Y Z correctly. And they should have no, and they should also agree that they have they have no relationship with the player after the um, the year is over with, so that they don't get taken advantage of. And then they have to do that in order to get a whatever bonus there is from their contract. So I figure like this, if you're an NBA player and you're making all that millions of dollars, you, first of all, you should have somebody or you should be looking over who's doing your money because that's why a lot of these guys go broke because their accountant or somebody close to them is secretly taking money from yeah. them. So if I have me in that position, I'm, I would know every single dime and dollar and where it goes and I would talk to my financial person but every when, single when day. When you're 21 or 22, are you, would you have been doing Hell that? Hell yeah. I mean, if I was really, if I but was really knowledgeable of what's going on. No, 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 21. Yeah. No, you just out there 
you know, part, but you know, that's why you have people on your side that say, "Hey, you know, you need to go check your account. Or, or did you see this or see that?" And then they have somebody that's actually on, you know, have your back, uh, which is rarely fine. But you know, you have that one or two person that you can rely on and help with that. I, I think that the NBA could do a, um, it, it would they would do a trim. Like, look, the NBA put a whole BLM sticker on like a whole BL plastered their entire court with BLM signs and they had all the players put these social justice messages on the back of their jerseys, right? If they really meant what they what what they're saying, if they really were about um, all this whole social justice stuff, they would be contacting people, representatives, and they, they would be in, in a partnership with like Morgan Stanley and Bank of America and JP Morgan and every single T D Ameritrade and every single brokerage and bank in the entire country to try to implement something like this so that you can actually start building wealth in those in black communities. No, it sounds awesome. But, like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that, that? That's literally what they but should be doing. We're talking about the NBA who makes a lot of money and create a bubble so they can keep their TV sponsors to continue to make this money. And I get it. You're playing guys $40 million a year, um, and you have to make sure you pay these bills. But at the same time, it's like you, know, you need to put some of this money to um, – like you said, help the people who actually need the help. Yeah, but but how much is that really going to cost to um, create a partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase to start teaching financial literacy to the players in the NBA, most of them who are black, and that money could um, – the money that is being generated through salaries could grow exponentially. Like you could start redefining wealth in black communities for generations to come if you start doing that. Well, it takes somebody who, like I said earlier, who actually care and actually want to make change because you, you can say it at all. It was actually somebody going out there actually, actually doing, doing it. it. But, you, you know, know that's, I mean? that's what we're doing this podcast, to start bouncing ideas off each other, and eventually yeah. somebody could hear it, and maybe yeah. it'll actually come to fruition one day because I think that could solve – I mean, it's not going to solve all the problems, right? But I think that, that would go a long way towards making things a lot – better and i think when people feel like they can breathe above water generally things positive things also snowball mm. so if you start you know building more wealth in in black communities uh, if you start teaching financial literacy programs in um, certain neighborhoods and if you start making people feel as though they can benefit and prosper from our economic system um, the same way some kid growing up in westlake can you're going to start seeing a lot more changes happen within the next 10 20 30 40 50 years because once people start to see opportunities that all that only snowballs. Yes, um, a lot of that, um, and I'm gonna it has to deal with voting or even knowing who to vote for or paying attention to that because until you vote or it actually know what's going on within that voting, um, nothing's gonna change. You know what I mean? So you gotta actually people tell you, hey, but you know, you know, how, there's a I don't know what the exact amount is, but a lot of percentage of those NBA players didn't vote. So it's like, yes, you talk about change and vote and have all these commercials, but you didn't even go vote. Like, well, it's kind of contradictory. Yeah, but then the tech me. companies are also censoring information about the candidates that they don't prefer either. <laughs> you know, like, so it's like. <laughs> but at least, at least you you're knowledgeable. At least, but if because if you're going to vote, you're going to go see who you're voting for, what their policy is about, and all that. So you're at least going to give make yourself knowledgeable of, of what's going on. You know what I mean, so you can't complain. Uh, when this happens or this gets passed or this doesn't get passed because you don't even, you, you, because you voted for the wrong person you didn't, or you didn't vote, you know what I mean? Or, or you just don't vote locally or you're not involved in your election or, or you believe the propaganda that's being told to you in the media. Yeah. Do you remember, um, do you pay attention at all to like stuff going on locally? Uh, very vaguely. Um, I, I, like I said, I try not to watch the news, but um, I, I I, I'll catch it on the radio. If I'm listening to the horn, um, which I normally do, they'll speak about. Do you, do you own a um, home here? No. Okay, but well, family, yeah, my family, yes. Your family owns a yes, home yes, in yes, Austin, yes. okay. So what, how does your family feel about Code Next? What's that? Code Next is, a, is um, the rewrite of our land development code that's trying to um, replace single-family homes with density, with multifamily and multi-use facilities. Uh, I don't have any idea. So basically, um, where, where, do you, where does your family live? East Austin, uh, Springdale and Oak Springs. And they have a house, right? Yeah. A single family uh, house. Okay. So that area is primed for economic development. They have right. P people building yeah. nothing and right And so, us. like, there's nothing a developer would want than for your family to leave their house so they can build a condo. They try and to uh, buy the house all the time. There's notes in the, they knock on the door, they offer X amount of dollars all the time to buy the house. And we've always said, no, we're not going to sell the house. Yeah. We have to. So. But, and then the more programs the city finances and funds for the sake of helping people, it's 
all it's doing is just raising your mom and dad's property taxes so that eventually they just have to get that you push them into a corner and then all of a sudden a neoliberal developer buys up your mom's house yeah but you know we're make sure you know we take care of that and you know we, we can make enough money to pay our property right. taxes so. but these developer friendly can't sorry to interrupt you but these developer friendly candidates a lot of times will co-opt like liberal and progressive um ideology and rhetoric and say the right you know tr try to um say the right things from like an identity politics standpoint to convince people like you or your family members to vote against their interests. Mm. Well, like I said, you have to be knowledgeable of what you're voting for, and knowledgeable uh, what they're trying to put out there. And like I said, you know, you're not gonna, you're gonna, you're not gonna please. You're not gonna be hundred percent please with anything. But at least you put yourself in positions to 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 where you're not, you know, paying these crazy property taxes. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I think I think that's um. Knowing who to vote for locally and paying attention to what's going on around your like the state and your city mm -hmm. is a lot more important than paying attention to what's going on nationally. Yeah, it, it like on multiple levels, it's <laughs> way more important to pay attention and be involved locally than it ever will be to like s scroll through Twitter and talk about Donald Trump all day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, he just got uh, if that's true, he just got kicked off of Twitter today. Yeah, and all, all that's going to do is just <laughs> martyr him. Yeah. All that's literally going to do is just strengthen that base. And he's just going to go on Parler and blow up Parler. It's just going to cause people to not want to be on Twitter. That's why I don't, I can't, listen, I, it's, I, it's impossible. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm like, okay, whatever. Trump got off Twitter, who gives a TV shit? show, yeah. He'll, he'll go on another platform. He'll probably start his own news channel. Like, none of that matters. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, uh, I don't, that's what I say. I don't watch it. I try to stay with what I. How do you, how do you feel about the, the MAGA protests? Um, can you remind me about um, a bunch of, um, the girl, a bunch of the Trump supporters? Yeah, a bunch of Trump supporters went to D.C. because the, um, Congress was about to certify the election results, and there was a big, massive event that took place to try to convince Congress not to certify the results for Biden. And there were a bunch of senators and congressmen, and I don't think not enough to sway it, but there were uh, like a sizable amount that were going to object. Um, and while they were going through the certification process, a bunch of these Trump supporters um, entered the Capitol. They swarmed the Capitol while this was happening. And then um, they evacuated everybody. And then they um, called a curfew. And then at, at night, they just certified Biden at night while everyone was gone. <laughs> um, just sounds like a shit show, if you ask me. Um, uh, he already said that he wasn't going to leave nicely or kindly. So you, you have to expect this. and. Yeah. Do whatever we can to make sure he does get out and the next person get their opportunity and we go from there. Um, so I mean, that's all I can say about that. Like I said, I, I try my best to not. To not, to not tell it's that. hard to it's hard to listen to him talk. So really, yeah, I actually think it's hilarious. I actually <laughs> it's, love not, it's not supposed to be when you're looking at the president <laughs> of your of your United States. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to be able to watch this guy and be like, you know, yeah, he's giving me some good words and advice and. He's gonna be strong and help us, but no, he's like, what the hell is he talking about right now? Like, I'm not. I'm kind of gonna miss it though. Did he just say that? Like, <laughs> yo, but it is fucking hilarious. It's like, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not supposed to hear that from my president. I'm supposed to not hear that. And you see, I actually kind of like that though because it took the mask off of what politics is actually like. I, I get it because the politics you can be kind of like, oh, be, be yourself, but but still be professional at the same time or. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> well, I think that um, my my thing about Trump is that, that is, it's this, right? I think a lot of pol a lot of people are tired of fake politicians who yes. say the right words and act dignified while they like repeatedly screw over working and middle class people and small business owners, and people are tired of that, right? But that's and been then, going on for years. For years, so. yeah. And so then here comes a guy like Donald Trump who just shoots from the hip, says what he wants, preaches a populist <laughs> message that a lot of people, if you listen to what Donald Trump says in a lot of ways. When he talks about being tough on China, when he talks about getting out of the WHO, when he talks about like, when, when he talks about um, us trying to stay open, when he talks about the dangers of globalism and all that stuff, you listen to that and you're like, yeah, dude, this is this is great. Like, I love a lot of this. I, I love this shit that he's saying. This is what we should be doing as as a country. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then you have like people like Alex Jones, who I, I love listening to Alex Jones. You know, I started listening for a long time. Like, I you know, listening to Alex Jones kind of made me want to get involved in do something right yeah. like especially his older movies like endgame and <laughs> fucking um obama deception all that stuff right but then 
you created a situation where Donald Trump was like the outsider conspiracy theorist candidate, you know? And so Donald Trump's problem is different because he acts like he um, is all about the people, right? And then he acts like he's fighting the deep state and mm-hmm. doing all this stuff because people want a guy like that. Like people, we, we know there's a deep state. We know there's a swamp. We know all this shit, you know? But then, and Donald Trump will, will um, appeal to these people, but then at the end of the day, he doesn't actually do anything, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, and as a president, that's what's your main thing. If you're going to say you're going to do something, it do should, it. It should yeah. be done. Yeah. And then his uh, way it came out a lot of times, He, I mean, I'm sure he had a smart guy, got good intentions, good businessman to, to, to own what he owns, but at the same time, it's like, you got to get a better he way of He threw his out. supporters under the bus. <laughs> like, he told everybody to come to D.C. and protest and do all this shit. And then he threw them under the bus. Like, not even, he didn't even wait the whole day. Like, these people were, like, these people were willing to die for this guy, okay? They were willing to take a bullet for Donald Trump, right? And what does this guy do? He tells him to go home at, like, 3 o'clock or something. Like, that. they, like, this is the lamest fucking insurgency the, you know what I mean? It's not, I'm not even gonna call it an insurgency because honestly, when you think, when you factor in the votes, when you factor in what's been happening these past nine months, like I'm have a lot of doubts as to whether or not Biden won this election legitimately. But this is a really shitty like. We we'll never know. So. It, it's a shitty protest. You'll never know, right? Like <laughs> it's it's a shitty protest. Like if you're gonna invite hundreds of thousands of people to come out, which was you were, you had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, probably um in D.C. at that same time. <laughs> And then you tell them to just leave right off the bat and you call in the National Guard and you do all that stuff when they're trying to take when they're willing to take a bullet for you. That just shows that you don't actually care about your supporters. And then, um, you know, if if you're really fighting the deep state, how come Edward Stor- how come Edward Snowden or Julian Assange hasn't gotten a pardon yet? Right. Like. Why, how come they haven't gotten pardons? You know what I mean? Or like, why haven't all the JFK documents been classified? Like, why aren't you declassifying everything? Because he's full of <laughs> shit. That's why. <laughs> and it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I mean, I don't doubt anything that he, that he does. But at the same time, I try not to pay attention because it just just runs you runs you hot most of the no, time. No, I I understand. And listen, like, you know, and he's um, not on my side. I don't think no. so. It's not worth listening to. So I understand it, and I I. You know, it's an honest opinion. He was a better choice than Biden. But that being said, when you factor in like what just happened two days ago, man, I'm kind of just like, I'm kind of over. I'm kind of over a lot of this shit, dude. Yeah, Especially no. like, you threw your own supporters under the bus after they did all that, like, and, and and blatantly lies. And we know he lies, but it's just enough. It's 2020 is enough with pandemic and all that. So at least with a, a different leader in there, maybe we can. At least maybe think there's some hope if things are no, nah, dude. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like with a bite, a Biden presidency will might cause us to go into a second lockdown, and that's why I didn't vote mm. for it. Because listen, man, like I never was like super shilling for Donald Trump or whatnot, right? But these lockdowns um, and like forced mask wearing and all that stuff mm-hmm. definitely influenced my voting pattern. Yeah. Um, well, as you can see, even with our own city, like, you know, they wanted to shut the city down during the the first uh, new year and all these businesses like, no, we're not shutting yeah. down. And they didn't. And um, so, um, and, but they still had their, you know, protocols and people sitting down exactly, and, yeah. and, and, and wearing masks and they're at their table and so forth. So, um, and I'm glad they were able to do that. Mm-hmm. And then the guy was like, if you know, if they find you, then don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll exactly. Yeah, we'll exactly. And this is a Republican governor that did that. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, I never thought that I'd be like voting red all the way down the ballot like last year, you know, mm-hmm. but because of these lockdowns, it changes the way it changed the way I started voting. I started thinking about politics and, and um, it, it's a big that's a big deal, man, because I'm just telling you this because you're my friend and like people need to understand what they're voting for. And people need to also understand like that the decisions that you make have an effect on. What happens in the future? There's so many people. That, you know what I mean? There's like, so many f- people that, you know, uh, I mean, as far as African Americans, I know because we don't vote as much, they, they don't think their vote is going to matter or have an effect. Well, if you continue to think like that and there's n- numerous amounts of you thinking that, then no, you're n- not going to make a difference because none of y'all are freaking voting. Well, so, it changed a lot this year. Yeah, it, a lot. Um, and um, so we'll see. You know, you, hopefully they'll continue to vote. You know, and, and but it's, it also seems odd that like these BLM protests kind of stopped once Biden got in office. <sighs> he wasn't uh, Trump wasn't doing anything to to 
aid that either. Like he could have said something or done something to kind of get the uh, protesters to kind of hear what he had to say. Like, okay, I hear you. Yeah, he didn't do a good job. And, 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 but, you know, he did, did do anything to kind of edge yeah. that. You know, well, so he, he also, have go. you heard about his platinum plan? Uh, I don't know, the you talking about the watermelon player? The platinum was it? Was That's it watermelon? I call it the watermelon. Why? <laughs> no, just share, share it. Okay, I want to hear why, that. Why? Why would you call platinum? Why? Because black people like platinum. Why would you call it? The well, platinum I'm just plan? saying. Just like, term- what is it? What are we going to benefit you? I think it was, it was a half a billion dollar package to like um, black owned businesses and black communities for like economic development and stuff like that. So. Did it ever happen? Did well, he didn't get reelected, so it, it. Well, he never really mentioned it either when he was running. Well, he mentioned it in like September. And then bringing on Lil Wayne, that was supposed to help his vote. And, and Fifty just, Cent. Yeah. Like, well, he didn't want to be Twenty Eight Cent. You got to- <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just think it goes along with all those the the the, the they just promise. Yeah, I'm going to do this plan. I'm going to do this plan. But does it ever really actually happen? You know what I mean? And. And what this, I heard the platinum plan was only one page, so. Really? All right. <laughs> I mean, what could you, what, we need more than one page. If, if you're really trying to make a difference or show that you're trying to help these people, like, the one page platinum plan is not going to help. And I, I, and I joke when I say waterman plan. I was joking with my sister, like, like that's what I'm going to call that. This is the watermelon plan? Yeah, because why, why platinum? Because, you know, are you trying to cater to African Americans or what? So, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, but what was your take on like? All right, no, I get it, I get it. Um, what was your take on the lockdowns and the whole COVID stuff? How 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 do you feel about all that? Well, most now we kind of get a handle of what what it is or how to. I don't even know if the testing is you know say it's ninety eight percent, but I mean, as long as we know what's going on and how it affects you know and who it affects. Um, then that's that's where we draw the line and then move on. Like, I, if from my understanding is, you know, the elderly or somebody who already has a pre-existing. Yeah. You know, I grew up with asthma, but as I've I've been an adult, I haven't had it. Well, you're an elite level pro athlete. You're a former elite I mean, pro athlete. Like, you're good. So yeah, so I'm fine. But you know, but for somebody who may have cancer or something like my sister had a double mastectomy. She had cancer at one point. Now, her catching it. Which may be a little different than me, but you know, you know, who knows? Like, you know, with these, there's a new strand. So, you know, yeah, there's so always some news. Exactly. I don't like. That's what I, I don't trust all these doctors and pharmaceutical places and all these vaccines well, because, well, and all that. But hey. yeah, well, that's because they're all financed by like Bill Gates and the Who, and Bill Gates is the big financier of the Who, and it's like you know when they say listen to the experts, I'm like, well, yeah, Bill Gates is paying all the experts because he makes money off the vaccines. Like, yeah. So. You know, okay, listen to the experts and listen to scientists, but what my take on on that is I feel a lot more comfortable listening to an actual nurse at St. David's or a doctor at St. David's mm-hmm. than I ever would Dr. Fauci. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Cuz they're actually um seeing patients and they're living yeah. this experience and they'll be, give you an honest opinion about what's happening. Yeah. And the lockdown was actually a- allow a lot of these businesses to, you know, put shields up or table six feet apart and you know do the type uh, protocols safety protocols that they they they, they have for covid uh, but uh, but these continual lockdowns like the january first lockdown i don't think was necessary no um, that just makes people want to vote for trump yeah that literally like like that makes people want to vote for donald trump and that's why i also kind of feel like these um voting results are questionable because i don't know i can't think of 81 million people who wanted lockdowns yeah, no. You, you know, like so that that's kind of weird, right? Like, uh, like I said at the beginning, when we didn't know what was going on with this this uh, whole pandemic thing, yeah, that's fine. But once you figure figure it out, we know the protocol, we know the masks, we know the plastic, the six feet, all that. Then we move on, and and, and these people can still open up and make money and, yeah. and be able to and just do keep it smart. their businesses because a lot smart, of businesses yeah. have without it without a business. And, and, uh, and also, man, they were closing parks in the beginning. I'm like, yes. you need vitamin D and sunlight, and <laughs> yes. um, you need to be outdoors to actually protect your immune system and not really suffer the complications of this virus. Yes, but at the same time, I mean, I know they're trying to protect us, and you know, and, and because like you know, if they're out there playing, they took the goals off the. The, the basket yeah that's someplace. yeah so you know because some people ain't gonna ain't gonna ab- abide by it they're gonna, abide by go, those rules. They're gonna go and, and and that was at the beginning but i don't think they do that as much now um when the, it's locked down so yeah because people just may have not known exactly what was gonna happen and yeah. doing all that stuff but I, I i feel as though these um the lockdowns and the handling of this pandemic is an excuse to start eroding people's rights away from them 
because eventually, you know, because look, man, um, other countries eradicated this virus pretty quickly, but that's because other cu countries have like 5G all over the place. They have masks. They have like security cameras everywhere. They have drones flying around monitoring your every single move. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to like enforce these lockdowns a lot better mm -hmm. than we were. But at the same time, like, do you want to live in a country like that? No, I don't want to have to be told to stay in the house. Uh, yeah, and, and have to be monitored every single ev everywhere you go, like Big Brother. No. And we already get that um, with our cell phones and all the data and stuff. Yes, but yes. to just have like cameras everywhere and to have like drones flying around and to have shit that's like happening in Australia and stuff that was happening in China and stuff that was happening in parts of Europe. You don't want that, man. Like that is not something that you want no matter what the um, circumstances and the Republicans are right about this. Like they're actually right on this one and it's okay to, it's okay to like look at all the facts, examine everything, be open-minded and just come to a conclusion that the Republicans are right about this. They're right. Like the Democrats are wrong about how they're handling this. Yeah. Um, and I was speaking with my girl the other day and she was like, well, you know, maybe they should create another party. I mean, well, they're trying to, yeah. So, um, because like I said, you, you're not gonna, one side is not going to please the other and vice versa. It's always going to be this continuous, you know, we're right, you're right, or I'm right type of deal. So um, with this mix, this other party, maybe you can find a common ground or, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what, but something can be done differently because to me it's just too much, you know, back and forth, blue and, blue and red type of deal, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, um, and, and they're all, it's like pro wrestling, they're all on the same team anyway, yeah. it's not your team, it's not, it's not your team that they're on at all, like, yeah, no, yeah. We, we, all, we all know that. Um, what was I going to say, so what was it like, um, what's it like teaching in the, in the middle of the pandemic? Um, it, w it was kind of weird, because um, like I said, I was, I was in the classroom, in the gym, actually, cause I teach, I taught PE uh, on my laptop, uh, and they would. I got a Zoom meeting, and they would be in the stay in the stands, and it'd be only like three or four kids, you know, because not very many kids were showing up during the pandemic. Um, so three or four kids sitting there, and I'm sitting across talking to them, you know, you know, giving them the lesson that the district has get, given to me to give to them, um, and a very simple stuff, just talking about, you know, uh, like worksheets on uh, what is that? Uh, health and you know wellness, okay. and wellness and stuff like that so uh and i would just say hey you know do this assignment and i'm talking to my computer but i could see them sitting across the gym and it just seemed like more but then i have with the attendance you know the people who uh was physical there of course i wrote the attendance but then they had people that come in that wasn't there that was in my zoom and they were doing it from home had to cap their that attendance with my class uh, and if a kid sent in work that day who didn't attend class or in the Zoom meeting, I had to go back and change the attendance as, as if it was just a whole lot of So what about nonsense. bringing the attendance down? Were people actually bringing the attendance down or were they wearing gloves? Like what were they doing like in terms of – They wasn't showing up. I mean, like you wasn't – like I have a Zoom class, a Zoom meeting. No, what I mean like – because when I, when I subbed, you know, you had to have – someone took the attendance down to the office like – Well – I we had teachers had to do that like it's all in the blend they they it's all on the computer now so you don't have so to take it, the, you don't have all, to take, you don't it, have to take it, down. it down. okay I understand so um are you allowed to criticize lockdowns being a school and, teacher in AISD and if it, and even if they did they hold on before right, you no, sure. even if they did they had uh, someone coming to get the attendance from you physically so they had one person to come pick up the attendance yeah. so all right so are you allowed to criticize the lockdowns for as what? Like, as a school teacher, like, working in ASD, are you allowed to criticize those lockdowns and not get, like, scolded or lectured or frowned upon or, or risk losing your job? Uh, probably. I don't know. I mean, my first right now, I'm not working for the school district. I'm just a long-term sub, so I'm not even at, I'm not at any school right now. So, um, I... The lockdowns for me, I, I, I'm not scared of no. what, what goes on. I've so seen you at the bars before. Yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> go, to, I'll you. go teach. You know yeah. what I mean? In it the classroom, it doesn't bother you. It doesn't, um, it now, for me. some of these other teachers that don't want to go there, that's their prerogative. I mean, that's what that's their choice. So, um, I'm gonna still go do my job and you know, mm -hmm. be do okay. You think, um, do you think kids should have to wear masks while they're in school? Yes, I think we all should have to wear masks um, mm -hmm. unless we're, you know. If you're six, if you're not six feet, if you're six feet, wear a mask. If you're away, you don't it's, have to wear a mask. Very, it's very interesting that you said that right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, no, because I don't, like, 
<laughs> but that's for sure because you because know, I've I've known people who've caught it. I've known people yeah, who've no, had it, yeah, and yeah. and this shit like, <laughs> yeah. it is real. But I, no, I know it's <laughs> real. Yeah, <laughs> I just don't fear it, you know, because I'm there. I'm, I'm not. I'm not too worried about it. I think that they should just been honest with us. If they just said, "Hey, man, you're gonna lose your taste and smell, and it might take a while for you to get it back," people would just say, "Okay, I'm gonna stay home." Like that's weird to go through life like that, yeah. right? But they were talking about people dying when the virus is like a 1% death rate. Like, just tell us the truth. People are more likely to listen to you when you're honest with them. That, that's mm-hmm. all. Yeah. Um, it would have just gotten a better response. But um, <laughs> No, if I'm at my house with my mom, I, mean, I, I wear a mask. She's 77. I don't want to bring No, I understand. Of course, and yeah. my sister has, has, got, has had it, and both my sisters and my nephew. So I'm not really worried about you're this. You're not worried. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah no. This is, yeah, I'm not worried. But about I, I think that um, – Having kids, kid, like going to school and having to wear a mask all day, all through childhood, could really fuck up your like. Yeah, because if these kids are going from classroom to classroom, all they're doing, if they're not getting it, they're just spreading around the whole school. But if they're all we've, wearing- had, we've got more staff to get sick than, than actual. Yeah, because most of the kids doesn't really affect the kids too much. So yeah, so when they're going around to these different classrooms, they're just passing around these different teachers, and then that causes them to have to get quarantined. Yeah. So that's what I, I that's what I don't like. Now they should go back to where go to one classroom. And I put them in that one teacher in one classroom, and then you know they'll you get stay, you, stay. you stay in one class. You know what I mean? Now, yeah. But I also don't think that like, um, do you get like mass breaks or what's the deal with that? We're about to wrap up pretty soon, but I want to like talk mass about mass breaks. What's that? Like, I don't know. I mean, do you have to wear a mask <laughs> exactly? Like, do you have to wear the mask like all well, day they, when you're teaching? Well, or what's like? How's that work, man? Because to have to wear a mask for like nine hours a day, in like school, that's school. Initially, you they ask, they want you to, but if I'm in a room, like I said, if I'm in the gym by myself and the other teacher's sitting across there, I'm taking my mask. Of course, yeah. Me, and he does too, you know. And I don't mind the kids but at the same time it's like if district or ta or somebody came down and saw that no one had a mask on they would probably be upset but at the same time it's like we can't ask these kids you can't ask an adult to sit there and, and have this mask on i can't imagine my daughter plays basketball for austin high and, and sometimes they have to wear a mask i, I, I can't they have imagine. to play ball with masks yes i can't they're imagine playing they're playing a season with play masks well some my, her, the coach is like you know her coach is like you don't you know you can wear it if you don't you don't have to wear it if you don't want to in games but are they allowed yes, like in the no game. in the games are they forced to play according to like the um uil Depends rules on, no no, no not you it's not a ul rule but some teams or some schools like you know maybe that has some COVID issues make them wear the mask but her mom's like, no, we, we, you can wear the mask. You don't have to wear the mask if you don't want to. Okay. Because I could have, because they're half the time they're pulling it off their face anyway. Because you can't. And there's breathe. all the sweat that's coming inside. You. That's not good. <laughs> that's not good for you. Yeah, it's horrible. And what happens if the mask falls on the ground and, and, and somebody you pick up, it back and up somebody up and you up use the same mask? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, so, so I think with the whole mask thing, I, my daughter stopped wearing it. She just doesn't wear it anymore because uh, now unless the school's like, well, you have to wear the mask, but. For the most part, they're not really tripping on masks. Because volleyball, they wore them. Yeah. But volleyball, you're a little spaced around, but you're still breathing and moving around. Yeah. And it's the same thing. So, Yeah, you know, look, I'm, I'm kind of worried that um, it could get to a point where if, if, like, a kid comes into school and starts talking about how, like, they don't like th- this mask wearing stuff is a bunch of bullshit or that they they're... They don't wear their masks half the time anyway. No, but if a kid's, like, openly saying that, I'm worried that it could get to a point where, like, certain teachers will try to, like, Get them removed from their family or something like that. Like call CPS or do something. <laughs> like I'm worried that it could get to that <laughs> level, and that's like nah. That's- I, I don't think it's gonna get to that extreme. They just, I mean, kids are gonna be kids, you know, because they're gonna because they're in the gym. They come in, they I got the ball, and you know, some of them got masks on, some of them didn't at the time. So, yeah. I, I, but they wasn't close to me. Now, if they walked up to me, asked me a question, I'd put my mask on. But like I said, at the same time, you just do it because it's, if someone would have come watch to see it, they'd be like. Oh, you know, you're not doing the right thing or you're not following protocol. But but ASC doesn't have a set protocol for the entire district, every yeah. school. And since most of it, since, since it is teachers who are, like, suffering from this, there needs to be some, like, physical fitness standards to actually be a teacher in AISD since most of the people who get serious complications <laughs> are, like, super unhealthy. Yeah. And a lot of the teachers <laughs> that you see in AISD – they are super unhealthy, and there's like no fucking excuse for that, man. Like we have state of the art gym. Every almost every every single high school in Austin, minus like ALC, has a state of the art gym that's nicer than Gold's, well, nicer than Twenty Four Hour Fitness. The teachers are pretty much able to go there whenever they want. Mm-hmm. Why don't you use it? Uh, I'd say it's just some laziness. I don't Lazy. Know. Uh, and and as what was ALC? They're gonna probably this gonna it's because they're building a new school over there. Uh, they're gonna have probably the nicest gym in the in the on this side of town because they they rebuilt it. You know what I mean? Huh. So, uh, LC is no more. But wait, they, no. So where do these kids go now? Uh, they don't know where LC is gonna go. From what my last hearing of what happened, because Lassa, which is in upstairs, LBJ, LBJ, yeah, yeah. they're going to supposed to go take over Eastside Memorial. Okay. And Eastside was gonna go to 
where ALC was, where they're building a new facility right there, Yellow Jacket Stadium over there on the east side. Nice. So, there you um, go. so the, their name is on there. So they'll if it's, But from I heard that Lassa made skip and move in that, and and they didn't want to, the community didn't want that to knock down because uh, uh, Anderson was a yeah. historic place. You know, what I mean, old Anderson was a historic place. The community didn't want it. This somehow still got it. Is the district like the district push that shit? Yeah, and and then they push all this woke bullshit. Man, it's ridiculous. So they yeah, already they knocked the LC down and already building a what? whole new facility over there. How is that? Like, I don't know. How are people okay with that? It's fucking crazy. Hey, we're, they're not, but I mean, I, I guess we can't do too much about it. I don't know why or why not. But. Yeah, we got to get more people. We got to get like some grown ups running for school board or something. Yes, we got to get <laughs> we got to get people signing the recall Adler petition. You know, yeah, there's and, a uh, lot of that. We got a new uh, superintendent as well too, and so she's trying to you know get the feel of. All and 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 her angle of what she's gonna do and how she's gonna do it. So, you know, who knows? I'm gonna probably um, talk to Randy about that superintendent. Hopefully, she can stay long because uh, people have been going in and out. Like teachers are quitting left and right. So, um, we who knows how this school situation is what's gonna look like in the next few years. So. Dude, it's gonna be a shit. I feel bad for these kids, man. They're, this is this is uh, who who's getting fucked with the most. You know? Yeah, yeah. They, they're missing out on a lot of education. Um, and but you know they're all being taught bullshit too. It's yeah. like like I said, you got to teach financial literacy. You got to teach essential teach skills. You got to teach people how to like run a business. Stuff you got to teach people how to use like, their life. <laughs> um, use social media intelligently. Like we're in a new world now. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Chris, we're about to wrap up. Um, how can people get a hold of you and tell us about some of the projects that you're doing so we can get that out there? Uh, well, I'm on all the social media platforms. Uh, Kclack15 is the Instagram. Um, uh, I'm actually working with a foundation called Bam Fam. Uh, we're about to do that ride along on January 11th at the um, Boys and Girls Club on the east side uh, where we're going to talk with the cops and uh, have a basketball between the kids and the, and the police officers and they can ask questions and so forth uh, on January 11th at 5 o'clock there. Um, and, 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 um, and I have also a domain, uh, chrisclack.com, that I'm currently trying to push up. It's going to tell all this information of, of what I'm doing, what uh, camps and so forth. Um, so hopefully that will be up soon once the website gets done. So um, it was nice of you to have me. I'm glad I'm able to come and be the you first know, one of the year. Yeah, you're the first one. You kicked um, up the year really well, man. Hopefully I did well enough to no, first, you did, get some dude, watchers. I'm, <laughs> I'm excited, man. I, I thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You're, you're a legend. Uh, I, you are, you are a legend heard. in the like city said, of You are a legend in the city of Austin. Like I said, that's one of the, what one I One of the most heard. humble legends I've ever known, dude. Like you... I put my pants on the same way everybody else does. So, I, I understand. Uh, but I, 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 I want to use that platform to, to build and, and teach kids and... And do something positive. So. Make it happen. So, um, your daughter, what, what year is she? She's a sophomore at Austin High. Is she getting looks? Uh, UTEP and Niagara. In, oh, in, in uh, upstate New York. Yeah, they've oh, contacted shit. her. So, she's only a sophomore as a first year plan. She tore ACL last year. Oh, but now shit. She's, she's back. She's ready. She's back. I, and unfortunately, this year, um, she has a new coach, which is her mom. Oh. Um, <laughs> her mom's a coach. So, <laughs> um, they have a really good team. Bunch of freshmen, sophomores, some juniors, and seniors is good. So, I'm looking forward to them. Hopefully, they go to state. No pressure on the head coach, but uh, they, no they, pressure. They, they'll they'll go far. That's another reason why I'm not coaching, so I can go to all her games when I can go. That's awesome. Yeah, because Lake Travis they had some COVID issues, so I, we they didn't allow fans, but you could watch them online. So you can view this, uh, you know, go to subscribe to YouTube. I'll go to a game with you, Chris. Yeah. yeah so I'll, hey, if you want, I'll, I'll hit up a game with you. Yeah, yeah. Even a UT game. Like I try to go to UT game, and they got they had my ticket in the mezzanine. I'm like, I'm not. I'm not sitting up there. So, uh, I'd rather Dude, you watch front it. Row. You are a UT legend. They should be giving you front row seats. Bef- the- well, yeah. COVID, all the seats are strapped off, and there's only so many seats in so many areas, so you can't. And the guys like, we can't do it anymore. Hey, let's, hit, let's hit up a game. Let's, so let's, we're going to definitely do that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you. All right. Boom. <laughs>